And I will start whenever you're ready. Okay. And start the group. So I can get started, right? Uh, do I click on the continue? All right. Yes, we're ready to start. Right. Um, so I guess I, we can get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Phys Physics Colloquium. And um, today we're very excited to have Professor Victor Tsai visiting us virtually from Brown University. So Victor, um, received his bachelor's degree uh, in geophysics from Caltech in 2004, and then went on to receive uh, his PhD from Harvard University in 2009. After, um, I guess, uh, two or three years of postdoc uh, at, this is, I guess, USGS, uh, uh, Geological Hazard Science Center. And he became, a, uh, he went back to Caltech and became a, a, a faculty member there. And, and, and become a full professor in 20, uh, 2017. But then he moved, on, moved to Brown across the continent in 2019. So Victor has worked um, on various subjects, I would say, in geophysics from modeling uh, uh, frictions, so frictions on, 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 on faults to glacier, subglacier hydro hydrology, tsunamis, debris flows, You'll hear some of those talked about today, but I think a, 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 a continuous theme for Victor is, is kind of applying physics, physics modeling to geophysical problems. And I'm not gonna list a, a lot, some of the notable uh, publications, but I just wanna mention that Victor also received the 2012 uh, uh, Archie Young Science Awards. That's one of the most pre prestigious uh, AGU awards. So that's the annual Geophysics Union meeting uh, awards uh, to sort of the, the, the outstanding young scientist. So with that, um, I'm gonna uh, let Victor take over and um, it, it's yours, Victor. Thanks, Kenya, for that really nice introduction. Um, and it's been a really um, great time visiting today, even though it's been virtual. Um, but uh, thanks for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so yeah, so today I'm gonna talk about um, applying physics and a particular type of physics, statistical mechanics, um, to try to understand some earth processes. Um, and the ones that I'm gonna concentrate on here today are on uh, processes that cause erosion um, and about earthquakes. Um, and I thought that these two pictures here um, would be good motivation for my talk. Um, so these two pictures that I have um, here, um, oops, that doesn't work. Okay, here we go. Um, the picture on the right um, is from the Kobe earthquake. It's damage um, that happened in the Kobe earthquake in 1995. And we'll come back to that in a second. Um, and the picture on the left, um, some of you might notice, or some of you might recognize that it's a picture of downtown Los Angeles, um, where you see all the tall skyscrapers in the foreground. Um, and you might notice that in the background, um, um, not so far away from downtown Los Angeles um, are these really big mountains. Um, these are the San Gabriel Mountains, which are just a few kilometers away from downtown LA. Um, and uh, the one thing that I wanted to mention about these mountains is that every year there's lots of erosion of these mountains, meaning these mountains are being um, eroded away. Um, the, the, the mountains are growing at the same time and they're also being eroded and that every year there's approximately 10 to the six tons of sediments that are being eroded from the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, and actually maybe surprise, surprising to some of you is that these sediments are actually trucked away um, on trucks um, and, um, because um, we don't want the, those sediments getting into the, the populated areas of the Los Angeles region. Um, so that implies that there's approximately 10 to the five trucks that need to um, truck away all those sediments um, that are being eroded from the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, I'll get back to um, this question, but there, there's this important question of um, why does this erosion happen? Um, and I'll, I'll spend part of the talk talking about this. Okay, and then on the right-hand side, this picture from the Kobe earthquake, 
um, I just wanted to emphasize here that every year um, there's a lot of damage that's caused by earthquakes around the world, um, especially um, or including in the United States. Um, so actually, I don't know what the statistics would be for Canada, but um, in the United States, approximately $6.1 billion worth of damage um, is done by earthquakes every year. So this is annually. Um, and um, there are damage to buildings like this, uh, this, this example from Kobe, which is in Japan, uh, but there's similar types of examples of this type of damage happening um, in the United States. And so, um, of course, at a, at a very large scale, then you might think that there's these, these um, earth processes that are quite important um, societally um, to um, people that live in various regions um, of the world, um, including in these ones that you might recognize. Um, and I did want to focus, though, on the processes here, where um, if you focus now on the processes that are involved, um, it turns out that on the left-hand side, um, all this sediment that is being eroded from the mountains, um, the proximal cause of that erosion is that they're caused by debris flows. So there's many, many of these things that we call debris flows, which are basically sediments being um, uh, washed down the mountain, usually, usually in events that are related to rainstorms. So um, there's some rain that happens and that washes this debris that was on the mountain um, down the mountain. Um, and um, this 10 to the six tons of, of, of debris or sediments that are being eroded are carried by debris flows um, off of the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, and so that's the process that I'm, I'm going to concentrate on, on, on for that side. Um, and then on the earthquake side, um, it turns out that meant much of the damage that we talk about related to earthquakes um, is related to the strong accelerations that happen in, er in earthquakes. And so you can think about there, there being multiple types of ground motions that, are, that occur during earthquakes, some of which are very slow um, and, um, and uh, where the um, displacements may be large, but the accelerations may not be large. Um, and other types of motions where the displacements may be relatively small, but the acceleration can be quite fast and can cause damage to um, these types of buildings. Um, so, so that's the type of thing that I want to talk about today. Um, and actually, I should mention that throughout this talk, I'm going to be talking about these two different examples. They may not seem very similar <laughs> to you, at least to start out, but hopefully by the end of the talk, um, you'll see why I'm talking about these two different examples of Earth processes um, and where they might share some common ground in the physics that describes them. Okay, so this is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and again, getting back to this idea of, of what processes we're interested in, um, I'm going to turn the question now to what, how we can understand um, the forces um, that are inter interacting during these debris flow events and also in this other case, in terms of the earthquakes, in terms of what causes these ground motions that cause lots of damage um, in, in these events. So I've sort of flipped the question from one that's maybe one of societal importance um, to this question about the physics and trying to understand what are the underlying processes um, that are most important for, um, for causing um, the damage that you might see in, in these events. Okay. So um, the next thing that I wanted to go through was I wanted to show you some examples um, of uh, what, these, what these things actually look like, um, because I think it's important to get a sense for what these events look like. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the debris flow one first, um, but on, on the right-hand side is the, is the case about earthquakes, and on the, on the left-hand side is this example about, earthquake, uh, about debris flows. And um, I'm going to show you this video which is actually a very, um, very unique video that was taken um, for one particular debris flow that happened in Argentina, where these people happened to be hiking over this region um, and, and where a debris flow suddenly happened. So I'm gonna play the movie now. And you'll see that people are just hiking along like normal. They're crossing what appears to be this very small amount of water that's flowing down. Um, but there's this guy who warns them, and all of a sudden, you see this dramatic debris flow. 
And I want to emphasize, <laughs> there's a lot of things going on here, but there's this very complex mixture of really big boulders, um, a lot of mud, a lot of water, um, and actually there's multiple phases um, that occur in this debris flow. So pretty soon you'll see another phase coming where I think you'll see some more big boulders coming along. Uh, let's see, maybe it'll be in a moment. They're now panning over to look at the people to make sure they're okay. <laughs> but there, so there you saw another um, release of boulders, which, it, which shows you how complex these debris flows are. Um, and actually, for those of you who might be wondering, um, it looks like a nice sunny day in this place, but actually there was precipitation happening, rain, rain happening um, upstream of where these people were. Um, and so um, that also tells you something about the complexity of these debris flow events. Okay, anyway, what I wanted to emphasize here was that it's actually a very complex mixture of boulders, mud, and water. Um, and in order to understand the processes, you might think you might want to understand this very complex mixture. Okay, so that was for debris flows. Um, for earthquakes, um, I just have this example here of a ground motion record. So this is how the ground was moving as a function of time. Um, so this is this vertical scale is actually acceleration as a function of time uh, during that same Kobe earthquake that I showed you the picture of earlier. Um, and so what you notice is that um, the, the ground motion also appears to be quite complex. Uh, so there's all these peaks and troughs within the ground motion. Um, it's not just uh, one cycle of acceleration and then deceleration that you might have expected if you thought the process was simpler. Um, it's this rather complex series of accelerations, decelerations, accelerations, decelerations that continues for um, approximately 20 seconds um, for the Kobe earthquake. Um, and for different earthquakes, it lasts for a different amount of time. And so there's this question now that you might ask about whether we can try to understand um, these types of events um, where there's a significant amount of complexity um, in them. Um, but before we talk about the complexity, I wanted to mention what people have worked on previous to, to the work that I've been doing. Um, and so to take a step back to talk about some of the models that people have produced for trying to understand these types of events. Um, and I'm gonna go through this very quickly, uh, but um, there's these sort of cartoons for how people um, have traditionally understood uh, debris flows on the one side and earthquakes on the other side. Um, and uh, these, the, these cartoons sort of simplify the physics in certain ways um, to, to an extent where we think we can understand some of the processes going on. So for debris flows on the left-hand side, you'll see that people uh, make a sort of cartoon of how the flow is flowing downhill. Um, and there might be a certain velocity profile to the flow that's moving downhill. Um, and the one thing I wanted to mention about that is that these, these flow models that people work on um, have been getting better and better with time. Um, and actually right now, I would say the state of the art for modeling these flow, flows of debris flows, um, they can do a very good job explaining the average behavior um, of these, um, of these deb debris flows in that they can, they can very well explain the velocity profile, the average velocity profile that these um, debris flows have. Um, but one of the things that it doesn't do so well is it can't explain very well the time dependent behavior, um, or in other words, the fluctuations away from that mean average uh, flow. And for that reason, they also cannot, they have a difficult time explaining the damage uh, that's created by debris flows and also the erosion um, that you might be interested in um, if you're thinking about this from a geologic perspective in terms of how the San Gabriel Mountains, for example, are eroded uh, by these debris flows. And then on the earthquake side, um, I've shown you a couple cartoons here of uh, simple pictures of how an earthquake works, uh, where basically people think about there being two plates where stress is loaded up, and then that stress is suddenly released, and that release of stress uh, during, um, during a short period of time is what constitutes the earthquake, which then causes the ground motion. Um, and there's various ways of explaining um, how that um, slip on that fault um, 
turns into waves that we then observe and can cause damage. Um, but one of the um, key things I wanted to mention here is that, again, these models have been getting better and better with time. Um, and now I would say they can explain the low frequency energy that's being produced by earthquakes relatively well. In that, for example, if you have a time series of the low frequency energy in an earthquake, um, the models for um, this sort of stick slip on a fault um, process happening um, can very well explain the low frequency ground motions. But when you try to uh, use the same model to explain the high frequency, strong accelerations that happen in earthquakes, these models typically do not do a very good job. And so here's the question or the dilemma here about, well, how can, how can we proceed? Uh, we have these relatively simple models of explaining the average behavior or the um, low frequency behavior of these types of events, but how can we explain this complexity um, of these events? And so today I'm going to talk about um, one approach um, where the question is how do we, the broad question is how do we explain or how do we understand these complex processes that have many, many degrees of freedom or many, many um, different things moving around um, during the um, either debris flow or the earthquake. Um, and I would say generally there are two paths forward. Um, one um, which is an empirical approach and one which is based on mechanics. Um, and I'm not going to focus on the empirical approach, but the one thing that I'll say about that is that um, usually empirical models are only as good as the data that goes into it. So um, if you have good observations of certain events and those observations span all the types of events that you might try to predict in the future, then empirical models seem to be or, or can be very good. Um, but one of the failures of empirical models is when the observations that you have don't span um, all the different types of events that you might be interested in. And so I'm going to focus really on trying to apply physics um, to try to understand um, these complex systems. Um, and because we're talking about complex systems, um, statistical mechanics turns out to be uh, a useful approach. And so I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about how to use statistical mechanics to try to understand um, earth processes, particularly debris flows and earthquakes. Um, and just as an outline as to how the rest of this talk is going to proceed, um, I'm going to give you a brief history and outline of classical statistical mechanics. I'm going to try to condense the whole course's worth of material into just one slide here, um, where I'll talk about the key assumptions um, that go into statistical mechanics um, and the interesting results that are predicted. Um, and then I'll talk most of the time about these applications of statistical mechanics to um, either debris flows um, or earthquakes. And hopefully you'll see that there's actually a strong relationship um, between how we can explain these complex motions for debris flows and earthquakes. Um, I'll tell you about some of the main differences, both between um, the standard statistical mechanics approach and the um, applications to the debris flows and to the earthquakes. Um, I'll talk about some of the key assumptions, um, and then I'll actually focus on um, some of the interesting results that we can predict uh, with this model. Okay, so with no further ado, let me go on to this sort of brief one slide summary of statistical mechanics. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the, um, an ideal gas. So the ideal gas is the sort of standard way in which statistical mechanics is usually introduced in, an, um, in a university uh, statistical mechanics class. And um, there's this video that's playing, um, which shows sort of the example or the stereotypical example that's in mind, where there are many particles in a box and each of these gas molecules, each of these particles is moving around within this box um, somewhat randomly, um, where the, the rules that uh, are satisfied are that these are all identical particles and that they collide elastically with each other and with the walls of the box. Um, and the one thing that is known about this system is the mean energy, um, or sometimes people would call it the temperature. So you might have a thermometer um, that's, uh, that measures the temperature of the box. You know how big the box is. Um, and you then want to describe what is the 
velocity distribution of these particles. Um, what, what are other things that you might want to know about these particles? And can you describe it in a statistical way? And so um, I'm not gonna get into all the mathematics or the physics um, that, that goes into obtaining these results. But if you take this assumption, um, it turns out that you can derive um, a number of very interesting results that are related to thermodynamics. Um, and what you have to do is basically, if you assume that the most likely um, scenario is the one that um, is observable, um, or is the one, the most likely scenario given the temperature constraint is the one that, um, that would occur in, in nature, then you can derive all of the things listed here. So for example, you can, define, you can derive this equation about how temperature, entropy, energy, pressure, and volume are related, uh, which is the fundamental thermodynamics equation. Um, and you can derive these laws of thermodynamics that typically in a traditional thermodynamics class are taken for granted or, or are assumed. But using statistical mechanics, you can actually derive the first, second, and third laws of thermodynamics. Um, and very interestingly, you can also derive the ideal gas law. Uh, so PV equals NRT, maybe most of you are probably familiar with that from a high school chemistry class. Um, you can derive this equation PV equals NRT from these very, very simple assumptions about random particles moving around uh, within a box. Um, and you can actually get even more specific information if you wanted to know about the distribution of velocities of these particles. Not only is there a mean velocity that's related to the temperature um, within that box, but you can also derive the distribution of velocities. Um, and it turns out that you get this Maxwell distribution of velocities that's well known um, in terms of how gases behave. Um, and that comes out of this uh, statistical mechanics assumption. Okay, so that's my one slide summary of statistical mechanics. And now I wanna tell you about how, how can we use this sort of framework to try to understand another, these other complex earth systems. And I'm gonna make an analogy here where for these earth processes, you might also want to understand some of the statistical behavior um, where some of the physics might be quite similar to these particles moving around within a box. And now you have to be, you, you have to take it with a, a little bit of a grain of salt, but um, these systems might look a little bit similar to particles within a box if you look at them in the right way. And so the key assumptions we're gonna think about here are that again, we're gonna have many particles and again, they're going to be colliding with each other. Um, some of the differences are that now inelastic processes will become important. So unlike the molecules within um, a gas, uh, which basically uh, collide elastically, when we're talking about real materials um, like rocks and boulders in a debris flow or like um, pieces of rock within the earth, um, then there will be these inelastic deformations. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that the forcings are going to be very different. So in a gas, the thing that really forces these gas molecules to move around is that the walls are moving a little bit. And every time a gas molecule hits the wall, it gives it a little bit of energy um, and, and causes it to keep moving around. In the case of debris flows, um, the main thing that's, that's providing the energy um, to these particles to move is gravity. Um, so gravity and, and these particles wanting to move downhill um, to, to go from higher elevation to lower elevation is the main forcing. Um, and for earthquakes, the main forcing is this tectonic stress that's being built up on these faults, which is then suddenly released. So the driving force or the driving energy is very, very different for these earth processes compared with, um, compared with say the gas or other statistical mechanics. Um, but some of the basic um, mechanics or some of the basic physics, which involves particle collisions may be similar. So for debris flows, um, I've shown this schematic over here where you could think about the sort of average behavior looking like this top panel. Um, but if you look at the 
individual particles or the individual boulders within a debris flow. Um, it might look a little bit like this, where of course this is idealized, but now all of these particles can move around stochastically um, within the flow. Um, and one thing that you might be interested in is what is the average fluctuation um, in the velocities away from the mean velocities at which these um, debris flows are moving downhill. And then on the earthquake side, maybe it's a little bit harder to imagine why earthquakes might um, behave like this many particle collision model that I talked about. Um, but one thing that is true is that if you zoom in into detail at, at most of these faults around the world, you will find um, quite a bit of complexity um, in these fault structures. And so here I have just one example of some of the complexity that's observed at these fault zones around the world, where um, you'll notice the scale bar here is one meter. So on the meter scale or the tens of meter scale, um, and also on the hundreds of meter scale, um, there's significant complexity in these fault zones. So it's not just a single fault over which you're loading up and which you then allow the stress to be relieved on, um, which I described before, or which you might have thought of with this sort of simplistic view of what an earthquake might look like. Um, in fact, there are all these um, structures um, within the fault zone, which you might think of as particles, which can collide with each other as the earthquake tries to um, release the stress. And so that's the analogy that I'm gonna make. Um, and I'm gonna try to show you what some of the consequences um, of this analogy are. Um, so now I'm gonna get into a little bit of the details about um, the, the various types of assumptions that we can make um, and what kinds of things we can calculate as a result of those assumptions. Um, so it turns out that there are different end members for assumptions that you could make about what these, um, how these um, many particle systems behave. Um, but one of the assumptions is called what's called a thick uh, rough walled granular gas, where you might think of there being something like a gas, um, but where these particles are relatively large and granular um, rather than point particles um, like in the, in the real gas um, or in the molecular gas. Um, and in, in particular, one of the things that you might be concerned about is what, is, what do the walls of your, um, of your um, gas look like? So if the walls are very rough and by shearing, for example, the wall, you can provide energy um, to the particles within this granular gas, then the gas behaves differently um, than if you had a very uh, smooth wall that, that, that can slide past the particles without imparting energy. And so one of the, um, one of the possible end members is this thick rough walled case. Um, another end member that I'm not gonna talk about much in this talk is what's called a locally dissipated granular gas, where it's only local interactions um, that change the energy of each of the particles. Um, and then I'll talk about this other end member, which is a thin flow. Um, so for example, you can think about how thick that flow is or how thick that box is. Um, and if it's thick versus if it's thin, you might expect there to be very different predictions of the model. Um, so for a thin uh, flow, um, but one that's also have, that has a rough wall, you, you might be able to make different sorts of predictions. Um, and the predictions that I'm gonna focus on are just two, um, which I think are the most important. Um, one of the predictions is about the forcing or about the impulses that each of these particles are impacting or producing every time they impact the wall or the ground. Um, so you might think of the wall of the box as being the ground on the earth. Um, and you might be interested in these forces on the ground. Um, and those forces um, or the, the impulses are proportional to the forces, also proportional to the length of time that each of these um, forces is active. Um, and you can think of it as being related to the mass times the change in velocity of each of the particles. So if you think about the debris flow with all those big boulders in it, um, every time one of those boulders hits the ground, um, the velocity of that boulder is changing. And depending on the mass of that boulder, um, the, a different amount of force is, is, is imparted on the ground. Um, and that creates all these stresses that we are then interested in, in terms of both the erosion um, and the potential damage. 
And then the other thing that I'm going to focus on is just the number. So in terms of trying to um, trying to predict how many of these uh, impulses, how many times will the boulder hit the ground? So it's a very simple thing. You might also think of it as being um, how many impacts are there per unit time. Um, and so that gives you a rate of impact. And so it's really these two things that I'm going to focus on, the amplitude of these forces um, and the rate of impact um, of, these, um, of these particles. Okay, so, um, so th those are the two things I'll focus on. And I'm gonna show you just some um, very approximate results um, for these two end member cases that I mentioned in the previous slide. So in the rough, um, thick case, and in the um, rough but thin case, there are different predictions you can make um, where I'll mention that the rough thick case actually looks a lot like the cartoon that I drew earlier, where you might have this very thick flow here um, that's actually composed of particles. Um, and the thin case on the other side, um, I like to make this analogy with a washboard, where you might think of the thin case as just being a set of particles um, that are going moving down a washboard. And every time they encounter these little grooves in the washboard, um, they, um, they interact with the washboard, or in other words, they produce forces and go da -da 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 as, as the particles try to move down the washboard. So those are the two different end member cases that I'm gonna describe. Um, and in both of those cases, we can describe both the forces or the impulses um, and the rate um, at which those impulses happen. So I'm gonna describe it very um, approximately here. So you could go into more details and get better approximations to this, but this hopefully will give you an idea for um, the basic physics that's involved, where in this rough um, thick case, um, the impacts, the velocities of impact are related to the fluctuations in the velocity away from the mean. Um, and you can derive a result where it's where this fluctuation is related to the size of the particles. And it's also related to the shear rate, um, which is a little bit more complex, but it's related to how the velocity, the average velocity changes with depth uh, within that flow. Um, so it turns out to be a very simple result. Um, and actually the result for the, the rate of impacts is also fairly simple. The rate of impacts is just related to the speed of these fluctuating velocities divided by the average distance um, between these particles which might be colliding with each other. And so again, this is a fairly, um, maybe uh, this equation is fairly obvious in terms of the rate just being related to a velocity divided by um, a distance scale um, between these particles. Um, and then on this other hand, um, in this washboard type of analogy, here the impacts are related directly to the average velocity because it's actually the average velocity is, is fluctuating quite significantly with every impact. And so you might think of the average velocity of these particles as changing um, a large fraction of the average velocity. Um, and that means that the, both the fluctuating velocities and these impact velocities scale with the average velocity of the flow. Um, and then on the other hand, the rate of impacts is related um, again to the average velocity, um, but now it's also related to the length scale between each of these ridges on the washboard. In other words, it's related to the length scale of your um, boundary um, on the ground um, not necessarily related to the size of the particles um, or to the uh, distance between particles like it was in the thick uh, rough flow case. So, so those are the two end members that I wanted to talk about. Um, and for reasons that I won't really get to describe here, it turns out that the washboard model is the one that's more appropriate for that debris flow movie that I showed you earlier. Um, and it turns out that certain elements of this washboard model are also appropriate for earthquakes. Um, it turns out that it's the impact velocities um, that also work out for the earthquake model, um, whereas the rate of impacts um, in the earthquake model is, is a little bit different from what I'm describing here. But in any case, we can apply this model um, and see if it makes predictions um, and see what the, those predict, how those predictions compare with um, what we see in the field. Um, now, at this point, I wanted to mention that maybe some of you are skeptical <laughs> that what I've described so far, 
this statistical mechanics framework for understanding these processes, you might be skeptical in terms of how well um, this might apply to the earth. And so we've tried to evaluate how appropriate these assumptions are um, in situations where we have very good observations. Um, now for the earth, it's quite hard to have uh, very good observations. Uh, but one thing that we've done is tested these ideas in a sort of um, lab scale, but where for us, the lab is still built into a mountainside. Um, so I'm gonna show you these examples of where we tested the model um, against um, these flume observations, where this flume is about a hundred meter flume that's built into a hillside um, where the slope is about 30 degrees. Um, and in this experiment that I'm gonna show you some results for, uh, we were able to make various types of observations um, we had these geophones, which measured the ground motion. Um, and for example, you can see some of the geophones that we had um, in these yellow boxes. So each of these yellow boxes is one of the geophones um, that is recording ground motion um, as the sort of synthetic debris flow is gonna flow by. Um, and we were also able to measure the flow characteristics. Um, so I'm gonna play a movie from one of the experiments that we had. Uh, and I wanna note, I, oh, I, before I play the movie, I wanted to point out that here you'll see, this is the ground motion from this um, geophone that's um, off to the, the left of the, of the flume. Um, this is about 40 meters down from the whole 100 meters. Um, and you'll see that the ground motion um, is, is displaying how the ground is shaking at that location. Okay, so I'm gonna show this movie now. Um, and initially what you see is that um, the, now the debris flow is moving downhill, it's moving down, um, and you can see that most of the energy being observed um, at that one geophone location is related to when the flow was moving past the geophone. I would say, first of all, ignore this initial pulse. That initial pulse is related to the gates of the, this um, synthetic debris flow opening. Um, and so that's not really related to the thing that we're most interested in. And maybe I can play this again, um, where, um, and actually you can see a lot of complex things happening within this debris flow, but I'm really just going to focus on the amount of force, the, the forcing that this debris flow is producing. And the ground motions that we observe are very much related to that forcing um, that we can, um, that we're interested in. Um, and that's why we use these, these geophones to observe uh, this situation. Um, so this is sort of just a qualitative picture for, um, for what we observed in this experiment, but we can make a quantitative comparison by comparing the ground motions observed at each of these um, geophone locations where we actually had about 50 um, locations where, where we were uh, making these observations and compare that with the type of model that we would have from this statistical mechanics framework. And when we do that, it turns out that the theory matches reasonably well with what we observe. And so this might be a little surprising too, but, the, but if you compare um, now, I'm not gonna describe exactly what these are, but this is basically energy as a function of frequency. Um, and the, the measurements are plotted in the blue curves here for two different uh, geophones that we had. And the predictions from the stochastic uh, impact model are plotted in the uh, orange line. So in this case, the blue line is here, the orange line is here. This is the theory, the theoretical prediction from this fairly simplistic model. Um, and what I would say is that actually surprisingly, perhaps the theory matches the observations reasonably well. Um, if you focus on the relatively low frequency part of this. Um, so if you focus on only frequencies below about 200 Hertz or so, um, and there are reasons that we think that the frequencies above that um, are not as well explained, but if you focus only on the regions below 200 Hertz, um, these ground motions are relatively well explained, um, and these ground motions from this other station are also well explained. Turns out that all of the ground motions from the 50 different stations that we had are relatively well explained. Um, and so um, this is actually, what I think is fairly good confirmation that the theory that we're working on um, has some relevance um, to these types of processes that we might be interested in. And so then we can apply it to the real world and have some confidence that the, um, that the theoretical model uh, might be relevant or might be 
uh, yielding uh, useful results. So now I'm going to turn um, to some of those predictions that we make, and I'm going to split it between the sort of debris flow case and the earthquake case. Um, in the debris flow case, some of the main predictions or some of the most interesting predictions are how the debris flows and the properties of those debris flows um, produce erosion. So at least that's one of the things that I was interested in. Um, and so one of the predictions that we tried to make is what is the power, the erosive power of these debris flows and how does that scale with different features of the debris flow? And so what we found from this theoretical model is that it turns out that this erosional power is proportional to the height of the flow, but it's proportional to the velocity to the third power. And it's also proportional to the size of the particles, meaning the sort of average um, length scale of these boulders or these other particles within the flow, also to the third power. And because of this very high power, that means that these the erosive power is strongly dependent on both the velocities and the average size of the particles, where it whereas it has, a much, it has a much lower dependence on the thickness of the flow. Um, and it may not be clear exactly why that is, uh, but you can get some intuition in terms of uh, trying to understand, for example, in that thin rough flow model that I showed earlier, that the velocities um, were, uh, what was causing the forces. So fluctuating fluctuations in that velocity caused um, the forces and the erosion power is really related to those forces um, where the thickness of the flow was not so important. Um, it was more related to the velocities and the size of those particles. So interestingly, we make some predictions. Um, for example, if you have a flow of a constant thickness but which is composed of very, very small particles like mud. Mud is just a, um, basically mud is a collection of water and very, very small pieces of rock um, that are in the sort of millimeter or smaller size range. Um, if you have a, a, a flow that's composed of mud, it's not going to create as much damage or as much erosion um, in a debris flow as when you have this, these big boulders and when, that, when those boulders are moving very fast. And so that's one of these predictions we can make. And not only do we have um, this sort of qualitative prediction, but we have this quantitative one where we can compare this specific prediction of H times U cubed times D cubed with the, the results in the field. Um, and I'm just gonna show one uh, comparison of that where on this plot is plotted the average vertical forces um, and these forces are related to the square root of the power. So it's, it's a little bit confusing, but this you can basically think of the vertical axis here as the square root of power. And on the horizontal axis is, uh, is an estimate of the maximum size of the particles that were in a particular debris flow times the velocity um, of that debris flow to the three halves power. And so, um, if you think about this equation that I showed you earlier and you take the square root of this equation and now you compare the square root of power to the square root of h times u cubed times d cubed, then you can see that this prediction would be that there's a linear relationship between the square root of power and um, maximum size times velocity to the three halves power. And that's what's plotted here. So this is maximum size times velocity to the three halves power. Um, and this is the square root of eros erosive power. And you can see these different debris flows that were measured um, by this group. Um, and the linear relationship, um, I would say does a reasonable job <laughs> explaining some of, the, um, some of the scalings between these different events. Although there are certainly some um, anomalies that we cannot explain with this um, simplistic model. So to some extent, I would say we succeed. To some extent, we don't quite succeed in explaining all of the observations. OK, and then finally, I wanted to talk about the, the earthquake predictions. Um, in the earthquake case, um, again, I didn't want to get into the details here. But basically, if you follow the same type of approach that I showed you earlier about 
um, making predictions for these debris flows. If you make that same sort of thing, but you do it for the, these earthquakes where the velocity fluctuations, you have a similar scaling, turns out the rate, you have a different type of scaling. Um, then what you predict in the end is that the high frequency ground motions, the ones that are most damaging, um, the ones that um, caused uh, primarily caused the building damage that I showed you in Kobe. Um, those, if you, um, if you take this stochastic model, um, the high frequency ground motions are actually mostly determined by the geometry of these particles in terms of how large um, are the sort of structures within that fault zone that you're talking about and um, what are, what's the angularity of those structures. So if you have a, if you have a sort of smooth um, but large particle, it would be different than if you have a rough uh, large particle in terms of what these predictions are. Um, I'm not going to go into any of the details about that, um, but, uh, but that's a very different prediction than some of these other types of earthquake models where um, in the sort of simplistic case, if you had stress building up that causes failure, um, in that model, it's only the stress or the amount of stress that got built up in that um, earthquake that produces the accelerations that are observed in nature. So there's a very different prediction in terms of whether it's the geometry of the structures or whether it's the stress building up on those structures that's most, um, that mostly causes the high frequency ground motions. Now it turns out that um, in the stochastic model, um, the low frequency predictions are very, very similar um, in that the, in, in this case, the low frequency um, uh, ground motions are still dominantly due to the stresses that build up um, over that fault, but at the high frequency ground motions, it's the geometry that, that mostly matters. And so we make these predictions, and in this case, um, I'm going to show you just one example of where we think these predictions actually satisfy some observations that people have made. Uh, this particular observation that I'm going to show you um, is actually from a long time ago. This is from a paper by Kanamori and Anderson in 1975. Um, but one of the things that they showed in this paper was that if you group earthquakes according to whether they have these sort of um, uh, expected smooth faults or whether you expect them to have rough faults, um, then you get this, these uh, these differences between the, the solid circles, which are the smooth faults, and the open circles, which are the rough faults. Um, so you can see these black uh, filled in circles are the ones that have smoother fault surfaces, and the open circles are these ones over here, which, um, which have uh, rougher faults. And again, I don't, don't want to really get into the details about um, how this plot was constructed, but it turns out that this plot was constructed where weak ground motions are in the upper left of this plot and strong ground motions are in the lower right of this plot. And so the model, the stochastic model that I talked about predicts that the smooth faults should end up in the upper left quadrant and the rough faults should end up in the lower right um, quadrant of this plot. And that's indeed to first order what we see here. Of course, there is other complexity, which, um, which we don't understand, but at least we can predict some of the complexity that's observed. Okay, so um, that's the end of really what I wanted to tell you about. Um, I've told you about how statistical mechanics uh, can be applied to these earth processes, like debris flows and earthquakes. Um, and I've also shown you that the stochastic impact model has very significant implications for both debris flows and for earthquake damage. And if anyone wants to um, learn more about these things that I talked about today, I would encourage you to read these two papers that I've published recently. Um, there's this one by Lai et al, um, published in 2018, which is talking about debris flows um, and the model that I talked about today. Um, and this more recent one by myself and Greg Hirth um, um, in 2020, which talks about the earthquake application. Um, so with that, um, I'll open it up for questions and let me just show the final slide which is um, a list of all the references um, to the topics that I've talked about today. So if anyone is interested in looking at these later, um, you, can, you, you have a, a summary of what I talked about.
Thank you very much, Victor, for the very intriguing talk. Um, so I, I guess people can type in their question on the chats, or, or um, I guess um, Pius can help us unmute them if they um, if they wanted to talk uh, and yeah, unmute it. All right, thank you. Um, so let's see. Okay, so uh, AW just sent a sent a note that thank you for the, for the lecture. I mean the the talk and the. PH1 